doctor Jesus said he'll make everything alright doctor Jesus doctor Jesus said he'll make everything alright I know he will yes he that he can perform. And I told you, I'm waiting on what he has for me this morning, so we're not going to be here a long time, but I'm going to give y'all a short version. I can tell you that it hasn't been that long ago in the early 2000s. In 2006, he let me see Eddie in Holy Cross Hospital when they told us that they didn't think we were going to bring him home. The doctors were ready to give up. But we got a second opinion. Now then in 2008, I told you I'm giving you the short version. In 2008, the devil said, well, let me play with Earl a little bit. And Earl was in the hospital. And when we went to the hospital, they told us, they said, we don't know if he's going to make it, but I'll tell you what, if by chance he makes it, the best that we can offer is that he's going to be a vegetable. Well, I tell you, he is without a doubt. I call him the singingest head of cabbage I ever seen. That's my vegetable. Now, a lot of y'all might remember when we were over at the school. He brought my brother Sonny in there on a walker. The devil say, if he think he gonna sing for God, I'm gonna sit him down. He ain't gonna walk. But I'm telling you that when they called on the male course, Sonny got his little walk and it took him a little longer to get up to the front. But he went and he sang anyhow. And God said, that's enough for me. He took the walker. Look at him today. I'm trying to tell you. I know that Dr. Jesus, Dr. Jesus, Hallelujah. he'll make everything OJ Nation and visitors, glad you could join us. Get your Bibles and your pens 
and go with us into our study tonight. Getting back on track, part four. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear most gracious God, dear old everlasting Father, who make the clouds his chariot, who walk on the wind, who's able to stand in all holiness, who is omnipotent, all the present, omniscient God. Father, we come, oh God, tonight to say thank you, God. We praise thy holy name, God. Thou art worthy of praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being our king, the majestic of your glory, God. Let it rain on us tonight, God. Father God, fill our homes, fill our hearts, oh God, tonight, that we may receive your word, oh God. Make our hearts, oh God, our minds like fertile ground, oh Lord. Call seed, oh God, to pour on us, oh God. Father God, bless the man serving, oh God. Father God, raise your spirit, stir up the gift that's in him, God. Father God, let him be like a pitcher, oh God. An empty pitcher, oh God, that your anointing, oh God, will fill, oh God. That he may pour out unto your people, oh God. That they may receive, oh God. That the world and their lives may be changed and never be the same again. We thank you, God, that we ask and you give, God. We seek, oh God, and we do find. We knock and doors, God, we believe shall be open, oh God. Father God, we denounce, oh God, doubt and fear. And we, oh God, feel our hearts and our minds with the God-loving faith that comes from you. Now teach us, oh God, that we shall be touched, oh God. Touch our past, oh God, teach him, lead him, and guide him. In the name of the Lord Jesus, that we do pray, we say amen, amen, amen. The grace of God will keep me from worrying every minute, every second, and every hour about things that God told me to give to him. Why should I worry about stuff that he told me to cast your cares on him? He don't want you carrying your cares. He wants you casting your cares. I go fishing, and when I go fishing, sometimes there are certain uh, fish that I like to go, uh, largemouth bass. And um, when I go fishing, I have a rod. And my rod, I got to cast it out. That means that I have to push a button, and, and the lure that I'm using will normally go 30 or 40 or feet out. Then I got to reel it back. In order for me to catch the fish, I got to throw it out, and the fish will look at it, and it will appear real, it'll move real, it'll vibrate real, though you and I know it's not real, and they will bite it, I'll catch them, bring it back, I'll release them, uh, but I cast them. I'm throwing out. If I see a lily pad, I throw to the lily pad. If I see a log, I throw out there to the log, let it sink by the log. Normally, those predator fish like to stay up under stuff because they like to catch fish when they come by, just get out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So I cast it out. God says the problem with my people, the reason they've gotten off track and even gotten addictions is because they're trying to carry stuff I told them to cast. <laughs> Lord, help me in the name of Jesus. They're, they're carrying burdens. I told them, give it to me. They're walking around with worries and problems that I never built their shoulders to handle. And the problem is I told them in the word, cast it on me. If they cast it on me, I'll carry it for them and work it out. But the issue is they're not casting. This is a word for 250 people. They're carrying. Write that down. They're not casting. They're carrying. So if you had a 20-pound weight that you put on your shoulder, you may carry it good for 20 minutes. But if you had to carry it for four hours, that 20-pound weight would feel like a 200-pound weight. 
If you had to carry it for 300 hours, that 20 pound weight would feel like a 2,000 pound weight. Why? Because that particular weight is not designed for you to carry. Nobody stays in the gym uh, for a whole week without leaving, going home to eat and rest. You're carrying burdens and problems that God told you to give to him, but you're keeping it on your shoulder, which means that's an act of flesh. You want to resolve it yourself. You want to handle it yourself, and as a result, that's an act of flesh. But once you understand the grace of God, go to the chat box, hashtag GG, God's grace, it will expel worry from your life, and you won't look like what you're going through. Are you getting what I'm saying? Let's go to verse 8. I'm still in 1 Peter. Are you sticking with me tonight? Glory to God. Verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, uh, be sober, be alert, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. How many of you know the devil is always busy? Verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers through the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Now, verse 8 and 9 takes a different direction than verses 5, 6, and 7. Because up to this point, Paul has been sharing that if we have a problem, we need to go to God to resolve it. And we need to get God involved, right? He's been saying that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand. Y'all sticking with me? I'm trying to walk so you can understand it. Then he tells us we should refuse to worry. Paul is breaking all of this down. Or we'll be anxious because we just don't want to wait on God. And so if you don't wait on God, you're going to be anxious. If you don't wait on God, you're going to be worried. If you don't wait on God, you're going to get a lot of wrinkles on your face. If you don't wait on God, you're going to spend a lot of time putting makeup on to cover up the worry that you're wary in. Uh, because we're not allowing God to work out what he desires to work out in his perfect timing uh, and with his perfect solution. But this passage, two verses, verse 8 and 9, he gives us a warning. Write down, gives us a warning. Verse 8 and 9 is a warning. He simply says, while we're waiting on God, we must remain steadfast, listen, against the devil. Because our, our enemy, the devil, is out to devour us. Listen to the terms. Peter says, I, I got to be real with you. I got to share with you. He says, while you're waiting on God, the devil is going to try to eat you up. While you're waiting on God, the devil is going to try to shake you. He's going to try to break you. When you commit to letting God do it his own way in his own time, the devil is going to come after you. That's why Peter exhorts us to be firm in him. Write that down. Firm in him. To be rooted in him. Write that down. To be established in him. To be strong in him. I hope you're writing this down. Immovable in him. Why are you waiting on God to work that situation out and to deal with your storms? And determine so that we can stand our ground in faith and trust because we're not leaning on our own strength. We're leaning on the power and the strength of the Lord. So, Pastor, what do you mean? That means that once you commit yourself to having faith in God and believing God to work your situation out, while you're waiting on God and the grace of God to come through in power and performance, because God's grace will always come through, expect, write this down, attacks to start coming. Why are you waiting? Why, why are you waiting? If I had Moses and the children of Israel, they would share with you, you can be delivered, but on your way to the Red Sea, there will be another attack. Glory to God. That the enemy has not given up, though he told you he was. He's still coming after you, trying to take back what you've stolen out the kingdom. Take back the progress that you're making for God. The Hebrew boys would tell you they stood up for the Lord, but yet they had to go through a fiery furnace. Attacks are coming. I don't know who am I teaching tonight, but you need to understand when you trust in God, don't think 
even though you got victory, that Peter says, you got to be stronger than ever because as you wait on God and his perfect timing and his performance to show up through the grace of God, you got to understand the devil is going to try to break you down. The very little hold that you have through faith, he's going to try to loosen your grip. Can I talk to 25 people who know that while you're waiting on God to work out something in your household, work out something in your family, work out something even in your profession? That the devil is going to come to try to get your grips to let go because he knows he can't stop what God is going to do because God is bigger than him. And he couldn't stop you from going to God, but he can stop you from being in position to receive. So what does he try to do? He try to make us anxious to resolve it ourselves, to outsmart God, to go and try to fix this situation. Because once you become prideful, then you put handcuffs on God to bless you. Teach, Pastor T. I'm doing the best I can. Once you become prideful, then you go into a level of frustration. And he knows that's his best way for you missing the blessing. Because if you hold fast to the profession of your faith and recognize the importance of the grace of God, then God's grace will always come through for you. Am I teaching somebody tonight? I want to speak a word to 25 people. If you know that's been your issue, lift your hands and say, God, forgive me for being prideful, trying to handle my family myself, my marriage myself, my job myself, my ministry myself. I commit to you your timing, whoo, your power to deal with my situation in Jesus' name. You ought to give God a praise right where you are because that's a step to getting back on track. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 4. I'm in the Amplified Version. Colossians chapter 1, verse 4. Bless the reading of his word. Glory to God. The Bible says, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, how you lean on him, I'm in the Amplified Version, with absolute confidence in his power. I like that. His wisdom, his goodness, and of unselfish love, uh, which you have for all saints of all people. Now watch, which is God's people. Now he says, your faith in Christ is how you lean on him with absolute confidence. I like that. That's in the Amplified Version. When I read that, the Holy Spirit arrested me. Because according to the Bible, when you read this, faith is, grab your, your pen, paper, I'm going to give it to you a couple of times. This is what faith is according to this text. The leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. I feel... I feel like jumping and shouting after I read that to y'all. Faith is the leaning of the entire human personality on God. That's your mind. That's your spirit. That's your emotions. That, that, that's your body. That's everything. In absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and good. That's, that's enough to get up and run around the track on. So, so when my faith is leaning totally on God, it is at that moment, catch this and see how this ties into 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. When, my, when I'm leaning totally on God, I take the weight off of myself and I place everything, glory to God, on him. I, I'm going to say it one more time. When I lean on God, I take the weight, the burden, and the worry from my family, my future, my ministry, my job. I take it off of me, and I put it on God because I'm trusting in him to do three things. Let me give you these three things, and I want you to write it down. I'm trusting, number one, that his power and ability will be able to do what needs to be done. That's the first thing. 
Um, I got to trust that his power and his ability is able to do what needs to be done. When you trust, you, you're not going to trust him unless, unless you believe he's going to do it and he has the ability to do it and power. Good Lord to God. Are you with me here tonight? Thank God for his word. Secondly, I'm trusting in him because I'm trusting his wisdom and knowledge to do it. Catch this. When it need to be done. Some stuff we say need to be done don't need to be done at that moment. Because we are by uh, habit and by humans, we're control freaks and we're very impatient. And our timing is not always God's timing. If I had time from Isaiah, I, Isaiah would tell us, I think around 55 verse 11, God's thoughts, do I have any Bible readers, are above our thoughts just as, I feel the Holy Ghost now. His ways are above our ways. Just as the heavens is above the earth, so are God's ways and thoughts above ours. So if his ways is above ours, then I can guarantee you his watch and your watch are not synchronized. His timing and your timing are normally two different things. Because while you're looking right at the situation, he sits high and looks low. So you're looking at one situation, and then once that situation goes out, you're looking at the next situation. When God looks at things, imagine him sitting on the top of the um, Washington Monument. And if there's a parade coming through, um, all you would see on ground level is one float coming in, then another float coming in, then another float coming through. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Even on TV, you see that one float, then it passed through, then another float, then it passed through. Now, if you're on top of the Washington Monument, you are able to see all 20 floats that is a part of the parade at the same time. Are y'all feeling me up in here tonight? Glory to God. And when God looks at our life, he just don't see your life in 2019, 2010. But when he looked at you in 2010, he saw 2020 already. He saw 2025 already. And so when he does things in our life, it is always synchronized appropriately, not just for the moment, but for the overall best interest of your life. I feel like I'm preaching to about 75 people. You have to trust God, not with the moment. Trust him with your life. And that's where we go wrong. We go, Lord, fix this situation. Fix this situation. He says, you don't believe I have the power. He said, give me your life. Don't give me junior. Give me junior. Give me your husband. Give me your kids. Give me your grandkids. Give it to me. Because I'm big enough to handle it. I see, I see Junior when he get 20 years old. I see your daughter when she's 25. I see, I see your brother when he's 60 years old. So if you give it to me, trust in me, you'll see my ability and my wisdom and my knowledge about the timing things should be done. Am I helping anybody? Glory to God. The second, wisdom and knowledge to do what needs to be done. But third, I got to trust his goodness and love, listen to this, and you got to write this down, to do things the way it needs to be done. And that's one of the problems, is that when we do it, we do it the way we think it should be done. We handle it the way we think it should be handled. Glory to God. We approach it the way we feel it should be approached. But I want to give you a concrete word for your uncertain times, that when God does something, because his love and goodness is so strong, it will always be the way it needs to be done. Are y'all feeling what I'm saying? Let me give you an example. Um, when Lexi was a toddler, I got so many memories, um, we would have some daddy-daughter time. We would have daddy-daughter. My wife would always be busy with, with Lexi, and so I, I would always take her and we would go to the park. She would be so happy. I put her in the back seat of the car, in the car seat, and I say, Booger, we're getting ready to go to the park. She said, I'm happy, Daddy. Let's go to the park. And so we'll get to the park, and she'll get out. I get her out of her little seat, and of course, she'll take off. When kids go to the playground, 
I wish I had somebody to know they just start running. If I got Sister McCallum here who loves children, she'll know they just take off running and I'll run behind them. And so when we would be out there playing on the swings, we spent time on the swings, we spent time on the monkey bars. Um, Lexi and, and I, we, we developed a game, and God, oh, I got to ask my wife, Lee, Lee you got to forgive me because we never told you about this, but you're going to find out tonight. Thank the Lord. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So one of the things that we would do, uh, it was some steps out there, and, and we would be together. Uh, Lexi would, uh, she would like to fall back after standing on the step. I would be right behind her, and when she fell back, it was my job to catch her, Okay. So she'll be running, she'll be running, she'll be running. She said, Daddy, let's get up over here. I want to do that game that we have. I said, okay. And so she get up on there, and then she'll act like she passed out. She'll just say, and I would catch her. I would get, we just would laugh. She was laughing the whole time. She said, Daddy, you ready? I said, I'm ready. I said, just, just, I'm ready. I'm ready for whenever you get ready to do it. I'm right here. And, and then she would, I would catch her, and I pick her up, and I put her down. We go running somewhere else, get on the swing. And then she said, Dad, let's go back over there and do it again. So she, we'll run back over there. She'll get up on the step, and, uh, and she'll just put her hands out, and she'll say, and I'll catch it. I will catch it. it. It was a daddy and daughter game. She laughed the whole time. And, and when she did it, let me tell you something. She was only four or five years old. She never panicked. She never was fearful the whole time. Never, 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 never. Now, now, I want to tell you something. If I had dropped her, she would have landed flat on the ground. But because I was there and it was our game that we had, I knew what she was going to do. When she just fell back, Johnny, I caught her with my arms and I picked her up and we ran and we kept going. And, and you know what? Lexi taught her daddy, the pastor, how faith operates. Real faith, teach Holy Ghost, Shabbat, is totally leaning on the Lord to the point where I can let go and let God. Real faith is when I just fall back on God's promise, on God's presence, on God's power. I'm not in a state of panic. I'm not in a state of worry. I'm not in a state of frustration. I just do what Lexi did to me. I just fall back. And I want to speak a word to 1,000 people across the world that in order to get back on track, you got to learn to let go and let God. Hashtag LGLG. You just got to say, God, I believe your word. I'm having faith, but I also know the importance of your grace and I know that you will not let me fall. Am I teaching anybody right now? God told me to tell you that you're in a season you got to let go and let God. We got to get rid of this panic, get rid of this worry, get rid of this anxiety. We got to learn like I did with the fishing rod, cast out uh, burdens to God and stop Carrying our burden. That's why we're so stressed out, because we're carrying stuff we ought to be casting. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now listen, I'm almost done, but I got a little bit longer to go. Listen, do you know that your faith and trust in the Lord is going to carry you through hard times as we wait patiently for God's grace to deliver us? Faith is important. And I'm going to say something that some of you may get mad about, but you're going to get it before we get done with this teaching in three months. Faith is important, but it's not the actual power that delivers. Faith sustains us until God's power in the form of his grace arrives on the scene to set us free. You got to get that. So when you say you believe in God for something to happen, you also need to be praying to the Lord saying, God, I need your grace. So now my prayers have changed from the way I used to pray. Now, when I go through something, I, I tell God, I say, God, I need you to give me grace for this situation. I don't need you to change the situation. I need you to give me grace to handle the situation. 
Because if you gave me grace to enter a situation, I'm teaching, then you're going to give me grace to sustain the situation. And you also have grace for me to move further in this situation. If you gave me grace to start the business, can I talk to some entrepreneurs? You're going to give me grace to sustain the business. And then you're going to give me grace to further the business. If you're a woman of God, you say, God, you gave me grace to become a woman of God. Now I'm believing you for grace to help me grow as a woman of God. And then I'm expecting you to give me grace so the manifestation of your power can be seen when people look at me as a woman of God. Glory to God. If you gave me grace to be a man of God, then I'm expecting you to provide me grace to develop as a man of God. And I'm believing you for the grace needed to develop and to further my walk with you as a man of God. So some storms that you're in, your faith is keeping you until the grace of God, which we read earlier, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. And we understand that that level of grace is blessings and favor. So which means in your storm that you're going through, you need some grace. You got to learn how to pray the grace of God. And in this situation, the reason you're getting frustrated because you're doing it in your own strength, you need the grace of God. Because your own strength always leads to frustration, and then most of the time, it'll take you to devastation. But now when I'm in the storm, you're in the rough time on the job. God, give me grace for this job. And the grace of God will come in that you'll no longer be frustrated, because like Lexi, you'll lean totally on God to handle your job, your boss, your situation, even if he has to move you to another department, another area, another location, but you're dependent upon God and you won't develop an addiction because you are frustrated. Frustration leads to devastation. Sometimes the mid, the mid tunnel is addiction, whether it's drinking, smoking, or other things to kind of resolve the fact that you're frustrated and you can't resolve it simply because God never intended you to resolve it. He intended you to do what, Pastor? Cast. Cast the job. Cast the relationship. Cast the ministry situation. Cast your health circumstances on him because the text says he careth for what? Remember this, people of God. Your victories come by grace through faith. And don't ever believe, this is a mistake that I made early in my walk with y'all. Don't ever believe that your blessings are coming to you because of your great faith. God had to convict me about that. Your blessings are not coming to you because of your great faith. Your blessings is coming to you because of God's faithfulness. Not because of your great faith, but because of God's faithfulness. Listen, I got more lesson. I'm going to have to pick up next week. But I want to share with you that God is ministering a word to us to get back on track. And I'm excited about you. I'm excited about your walk with God. I need you to stick with me. I know it was tight tonight. I know that, that we're getting in some tough stuff. And I know that you get convicted. But remember, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. We covered that in part one and two. So, 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 but the changes needed in your life are not changes you have to make. They're changes that our Heavenly Father who sits high, glory, and he looks low, will make in your life to strengthen you, to help you get to where you need to go. Glory to God. And I want to have a word of prayer with you before we get ready to close tonight because I believe that this is tough for us because we've tried to handle things ourselves. And the devil knows that when we handle them ourselves, pride sets in. And as long as I'm walking in pride, God will frustrate me. Because he don't want you to be blessed because of your efforts. Because you'll praise yourself. You'll lift yourself up on the pedestal. But he says, I'm your God. I'm here to help you have a successful life, successful marriage, successful career, a successful relationship, a successful ministry. But I need you to lean on me. You got to 
You got to learn to do what Lexi did. She taught me something. Thank you, Booker, for teaching your daddy what real faith is. And maybe that's why Proverbs says, lean not on thy own understanding, <laughs> but acknowledge him and he shall direct that path. Believers, beloved, lift your hands. I want to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your time with us in the word as you shared your truth, as you shared principles, as you challenged us, as you convicted us, but you did not condemn us. Because your power, your presence, your grace will help us to fulfill everything that we need to do. Not by might, nor by strength, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. I pray for every couple, every marriage couple, every single. I pray for every season saint, every person in China, Africa, every person in South America, every person on the West Coast, Mid -coast Midwest, East Coast. I pray, God, that you allow this word to help people across the globe to get back on track. To see that we no longer have to do it and carry our own weight, but we can learn to cast our cares on you because you care for us. Hey, Shabbat under the boho shataya. Father, I pray that you allow us to step back and trust you more and depend upon your word and to stand fast and be unmovable. And always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. We love you and we thank you for the victory that you provide for your people through your word. Somebody ought to shout amen. Beloved, as we get ready to go, we never want to close without giving you a chance to sow seed into this ministry. As we're teaching and preaching the things of God, I'm, I'm teaching this for another two months. God has said, my assignment is to help the body of Christ and believers across the world to get back on track. If you're being blessed, you can give. If you want to pay your tithes and offerings, you don't have no local church, we'll be your church. Whether you're in Seattle or China, you can give, sow those seeds in this ministry that we can continue to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to make a difference. We have three ways to give at the City of Joy. You should see them on your screen. The first way you can give is through a secure way to give called Givelify. It is very simple, succinctly, and it gives you opportunity to sow seed. As you receive the word, the Bible says that you should share that which is corruptible for the seed that you receive incorruptible. You can also give through Cash App. We have a safe and secure way to give that God has provided so we can sow seeds to do the things of God because we believe the kingdom of God has to advance to do what God has called us to do. The last way to give is through P.O. Box, P.O. Box 250, Clinton, Maryland. The zip is on your screen, and you can use these ways to sow your seed. You can pay your tithes and offerings. Whatever your gifts are, we thank God for you, and we thank God for you receiving this word. Listen, you've been blessed. Get ready. For next week, as we take it even higher in God, and remember as C.A. Thompson, your senior servant at the City of Joy, if somebody asks you, what is your life's motto? Please tell them, the joy of the Lord, it is our strength. Be blessed.